So uh, then uh, what I'm going to talk about is a joint uh, work with uh, Charles de Clerc and Anne Kigner Mathieu. And so all credits should be given to, to all three of us. But if uh, something that I'm saying today turns out to be wrong, then I'm the only one responsible because it's actually uh, undergoing work. And <coughs> so th there is a text uh, on my uh, website, which you can check out if you like, but <coughs> uh, we're still improving it. So it uh, will be changed probably several times in the near future and well but probably improved but uh, I believe that all uh, main statements there are correct well these are just um, the classical Chow motives I will be writing CM for the category of Chow motives to be more precise you need uh, a base field it will be F <coughs> and you also need uh, the coefficient ring, so which I denote as bold f, and it will be just z over p z for fixed prime p. So. <laughs> So um, if you have a variety x over f, which is smooth projective, uh, you can consider its motive, which, is, which lives here in this CM. <coughs> and homomorphisms from m of x to m of another, say, x prime, are given by the Chow group of the product. <coughs> x cross x prime, where I take the component of dimension, dimension of x. And uh, CH like this uh, will be my notation for Chow like in Totara's talk, <coughs> with uh, coefficients in bold f. <coughs> so I'm lucky, so after Totara's talk, I don't need to say anything about uh, the Chow uh, group anymore. So just don't forget that my coefficients are not z and not an arbitrary ring, but this field. <coughs> OK, so also. It's important to keep in mind that for, well, what I'm working with is the category of effective Chow motives. So my CM is like that. <coughs> and so for non-negative integer i, <laughs> and any object M, so any motive, uh, I can consider shift of M by I, which I'm going to write down using the curly brackets. So this is I state shift of M, also an object here. And I only have it for no negative I because I'm working with effective child motives. <coughs> Well, uh, objects like this, uh, these are particular objects, ob uh, motifs of varieties, but any M in CM uh, <coughs> can be obtained, well, either summoned, direct summoned, in M of X for some X, given by some project, uh, projectors, uh, projector isn't it important, it important in endomorphisms, endomorphisms of 
m of x. So this way you have already all objects. And well, the standard example, well, uh, maybe first of all, some important of the motive of the point. I will write m of f, f the base field. This is uh, uh, just m of spec f. <coughs> and I can also shift it by any non-negative i. All this I will be calling Tate motives. And then the standard example is the motive of the projective space, <coughs> which decomposes uh, as m of f plus m of f of 1 plus and so on up to m of f of n. So the direct sum decomposition in a sum of state motives. And actually, to explain the uh, appearance of this shift functor, so if you apply this for n equals 1, then you just have this part. And so you can just define m of f of 1 as the complementary summons to m of f in the motive of the projective line. And then, uh, m of f of i will be i standard power of this one. The, this category has a tensor structure, tensor product, uh, just induced by usual product of, uh, direct product of varieties. And uh, so you can take it as uh, the definition and then m of i for arbitrary m is defined as the tensor product of m with m of f of i. So this is it about uh, the Chow motifs. Now I'm going to look at the Chow motifs of projective homogeneous varieties, uh, by which I mean projective homogeneous Varieties. <coughs> so if I'm given a semi-simple group G over my base field, and a G variety X, so it is smooth projective. If uh, over uh, an extension of the base field, I can take separate closure, for instance. Let me write f bar for it. It's just a quotient. It's isomorphic to the quotient of G by a parabolic subgroup. So most strictly speaking is G over f bar over P, where P G f bar is smooth parabolic Some group. <coughs> and so my variety is smooth projective. And so I can consider its motive in my motivic category. Well, uh, it is known that it, is, it can be decomposed in a sum, in a finite direct sum of decomposable. So in different contexts, people say that the Kruhl-Schmidt property holds. Which in this particular context, I, I guess, is due, is due to Chernozov and Merkuriev. which says that m of x is sum of, well, let me just write sum. It's direct sum and often decomposables. The 
and moreover, such a decomposition is unique in the usual sense. So, of course, the question arises immediately, can we say something specific about these summons, which we meet when we decompose, when we consider a complete decomposition of the motive of a projective homogeneous variety. So, this is the question, what can we say about the summons? Well, at least uh, there is one summit which is easy to put hands on. Uh, namely, let's apply the Chow functor, which uh, is also defined on the category of Chow motives. Uh, namely, let's take Chow zero with upper zero and apply it to, to, to x. Well, this will be just f, uh, which is the same as Chow of the motive of x, and then you use the decomposition, and so you get, um, you will get uh, f at some point. Well, I mean, the f, f is one dimensional vector space, and so it can be decomposed, so it appears once somewhere, and then uh, you have zeros everywhere else. And so, this distinguishes a summand in this complete motivic decomposition of M of X, so, which I like to call U, uh, to, to denote U of X and call the upper motives, motive. Of X. So the defining property of it is, well, it's a direct summand. <coughs> In the composable direct summand, the in the composable summand in M of X with <coughs> Chow zero of U of X, a non trivial, so non trivial means equal to F. whatever you prefer. Well, uh, why do I call it upper? <coughs> well, the, the point is that it's the easiest summand in the decomposition. So all others are hidden more deeply inside of the motive of X. And this one is uh, very easy to control. And why it's so? Well, this uh, here is the precise st statement one has. U of x is isomorphic to U of some other, say x prime, if and only if x prime over f of x and x over f of x prime, these varieties are isotropic. Which means that they have, <coughs> each of them has a zero cycle. Has a zero cycle of uh, degree one. Uh, notice that for our child group, the degree homomorphism takes value in f in the coefficient ring, and so uh, let me write it down. Have zero cycles of degree one in both f. So for the integral zero cycles, this means that you have one of degree co prime with p. And in terms of close points, it means that you have a close point of degree co prime with p. <laughs> OK, so I hope you agree that this is a very easy criterion of isomorphism. I will write <coughs> x equivalent to x prime in this situation. <coughs> 
So x is equivalent to x prime if and only if the upper motifs, the upper motifs are isomorphic. <coughs> and here is the theorem now, <coughs> sort of answering the question about complete uh, motivic decomposition, but only in the case that, uh, where the group, our group, algebraic group G, semi-simple group G, is uh, of inner type. By which I mean that uh, there is a standard so-called star action of the Galois group, of the absolute Galois group of the field on the Dinkin diagram of G. And so inner type means this star action is trivial. I will consider example right after I state the theorem. <coughs> So it's a theorem uh, of myself, but uh, an old one. So I not yet come to uh, coming to the new material. <coughs> so summons in the composable summons in the complete decomposition of M of X are of the kind U of Y of um, well with some shift where y is uh, another projective g-homogeneous variety. So each summand is like that. And uh, pro from summand to summand, y may vary. Of course, I, the, shift, the shifting number may vary uh, as well. So now to explain well, to give an example uh, where this uh, theorem applies, well, let me say first that in general, in this context, you always may assume that G is a joint. You can reduce to this case. So now if we take a simple group, uh, absolutely simple group of type AN, well, group G, then this will be a projective unitary group of B tau, uh, where B is a central simple algebra over some quadratic extension of the base field F. Uh, degree of B is n plus 1, and tau is uh, involution of unitary Type, so unitary involution. <coughs> so now, now if K over F is uh, actually a field, so in general it's a quadratic Italy algebra, Italy algebra, so K a field, well, let me say it like that, <coughs> G is of inner type. Precisely means that the quadratic uh, algebra K over F is split. Okay. In which case uh, B becomes a product of A, A op for central simple L F algebra A over F well, of the same degree as before but now over F, and uh, tau becomes the switch. So the involution sort of disappears. You are left with uh, just one algebra A, and G becomes uh, PGL1 of A, which is just sort of scientific notation for the automorphisms of A over F. <coughs> By the way, here it's also the group of automorphisms of B tau. So automorphisms respecting taking care of tau, but over K. So it's important to put over K. Uh, if you put over F, then you get non-connected group. And you will need to take the connected component of it. 
So uh, this is uh, for type A n. The situation, the situation where um, the theorem applies, right? And uh, the varieties, G, vari uh, G varieties, projective homogeneous one, are the varieties of flux, possibly, of uh, ideals, uh, one sided, say, right? Ideals. in A. <clears throat> and well, uh, among them, you have a several Brouwer variety and generalized several Brouwer varieties, like SBI A. And one application of the theorem just, well, I mean, if you look at this theorem, it doesn't tell you what the decomposition is precisely, right? But uh, it gives you some information which you can use in each particular case, hoping to get something more or even to, to obtain the precise decomposition. And <coughs> you can also uh, sometimes get some properties for the corresponding varieties. For instance, uh, uh, what I made this theorem for was for computation of canonical dimension, canonical p dimension of all such varieties arising here. I, I don't want to explain what uh, canonical dimension, canonical p dimension is, but uh, one particular case is where degree of a is a p power. And A is a division algebra. And uh, X is several Brouwer variety uh, where the reduced dimension of the ideals you are taking is also a P power, P to the I, A. Then you can, one can prove that every a rational map from X to itself, rational self map, is dominant. So very strong property. Okay, so just one example. Uh, and actually you prove a stronger property. You prove that uh, in the corresponding decomposition you have for this variety, the upper motif of the variety X itself appears only once. And this is enough uh, to get this result about rational self maps. <coughs> okay. Be clear. Yeah, so I probably skip, I, I plan to go through other absolutely simple groups and to look uh, what do we have. So sometimes you have no uh, automorphisms for the Dinkin diagram, and th therefore uh, all uh, groups are of inner type. So the only interesting case is DN and then E6 and so forth. Well, interesting, I mean, uh, or the only case not covered by the theorem. Right, and uh, another source of um, uh, groups of non-inner type, so other source non-inner outer type would be uh, taking the weight transfer. Okay, so uh, a lot of groups actually are not covered, so <coughs> it was interesting to look what happens with them. <coughs> 
But before I go to, to this, I should mention another application of the theorem. <coughs> so which is now, which is <coughs> very recent and uh, due to uh, my co-authors, so De Clerc and Kiginer. So they, well, it's like uh, last year and uh, very recently accepted uh, for publication in Kyle. So uh, Tate trace of X, they define it So you just look at the complete motivic decomposition of X and take only the part consisting of uh, Tate motives. <laughs> so Tate part of complete motivic decomposition. And then, then they prove that motives of two varieties like that are isomorphic if and only if <coughs> they have the same Tate traces but not only over the base field also over any extension of the, of the base field over so like Bert said when you have a variety, you should also think about this variety or all possible extensions <coughs> of the base field, and this is what you do here. <coughs> so they call it, uh, they call the situation uh, like uh, both varieties have the same higher Tate traces. But uh, one can just say like that. Okay, so uh, two observations. So, uh, if you don't like uh, Tate traces, you may speak about um, isotropic Chow groups uh, introduced by Vishik. So, same Vishik's isotropic Chow groups. So, this is some modification of the usual Chow groups, which uh, does not see uh, motives uh, or does not see. Uh, anisotropic varieties and all. And um, what do we kill when we go from the complete decomposition to the Tate trace? We just uh, neglect uh, uh, summons which live on anisotropic varieties. And uh, therefore, uh, you can also f reformulate this uh, criterion using uh, isotropic Chow groups. And uh, at the same time, uh, this generalizi generalizes this result of uh, DQ, generalizes Vishek's criterion, criterion for, uh, for the case where X and X uh, prime are quadrics. For quadrics. So this is really a very vast generalization. <coughs> and uh, uh, I also should notice that you don't need to be X and X prime uh, homogeneous under the same group G. So the groups can be different. And you can also, you also have, uh, they actually prove some more general statement where uh, instead of motive of a variety, you just consider an arbitrary sum of upper motives with some shifts uh, coming from some projective homogeneous varieties under uh, arbitrary groups, not necessarily the same. <coughs> so all this works yeah. with the same statement, yes? Is there a possible criterion like the one with the zero cycle over field Well, no, well, I mean, it's, pro well, I, I, I don't know. So, so it's sort of non-related. Non you, you see uh, this state trace, uh, it has, of course, the mo mo it may contain the motive of the point, but also some shifts of them. So, so uh, the non-zero groups are spread 
all over, so it's sort of different. Okay, so what happens? In, uh, well, at least I, I think that for previous applications, uh, this could be already enough because uh, when talking about canonical p dimension, you are always allowed to make uh, extensions of the base field of degree co prime with p. And so, well, uh, so some slight generalization of this would be already enough, but at least for uh, generalization about uh, criterion of Machivic isomorphism, it would be interesting to have analog, an analog of this old theorem where the uh, restriction that the group is of inner type is removed. And so what can we say uh, in the case uh, when G is any? Well, <coughs> then the kernel of the star action uh, gives you finite Galois extension, extension of the base, so let me call it E over F, such that GE is of inner type. <coughs> and, so, well, at least we have some examples where we the things are computed. So one example due to, again, Chernousov, uh, now with uh, Stefan Gile and again Merkuriev. <coughs> so if G is quasi-split, then uh, for any uh, G homogeneous variety X, the motive of X is the sum uh, the <coughs> where each summand uh, looks like, uh, like this. So you have some intermediate extension L sitting between F and E. So you consider the motive of L, or which is the motive of spec L, which you consider as F variety. So I write F like this. <coughs> so this gives you an F motive, and as usual with some shift. Okay, this is how habitary summand looks like. Uh, well, uh, this one uh, does not need to be in the composable. So. Uh, well, let me write M, L, F for it. Well, it's uh, some separable, finite separable extension of F sitting inside of E. And E is this minimal Galois extension, or minimal extension, or field extension over which our group becomes of uh, inner type. I see, one L that, that gives you all the sum No, no, it, it, varies, it, it varies, it varies. Oh, the L might vary. Yeah, L oh, varies. Okay. But, uh, well, it's easy to work out concrete examples where you can get pretty much everything between F and E uh, in place of L. And the motive like that can, be, uh, can decompose further. Decompose. Actually, uh, summons of this motive are called Artin motives. So Artin motives appear this way. And so in the end, you get a decomposition, complete decomposition, where each summand is a shift of an Artin motive. Uh, they call it Tate Artin, uh, Artin Tate motives. Well, just shifts of Artin motives. Over any field, so my base field is F. Uh, but uh, I'm assuming that G is quasi split now. Ah, okay. This is an example. Just to show you that <coughs> you can't hope to get the same statement, precisely the same sta statement as before, because <coughs> here the Chow zero is already one dimensional. Okay? This means that Artin mo any Artin motive A, extra Artin motive A, which appear here, well, if there are more than one, then 
you will have some with trivial Chow zero. But these are zero dimensional motifs, summons in the motif of a zero dimensional variety, like here. So there is no Chow group at all. So Chow, the entire Chow group, well, let me put star of A is zero. So <coughs> I mean, this has no chance to be upper motif or a shift of an upper motif uh, in the sense I defined it before, right? Because the defining property of an upper motif is non zero. A, co a non zero component in the Chow group. Uh, well, you, you should have a Borel subgroup uh, defined over the, uh, over the base field. So, so uh, roughly all homogeneous varieties which appear here have a rational point. So, uh, this is why sort of upper motives be become trivial. But uh, the, the point uh, thing is that you can stay over the base field, you, you will have summons. Uh, coming from some extensions, and so because of that, uh, the situation is a little bit more complicated than it would be for quasi-split group of inner type, which is just split group, right? So for split group, you will get just some of Tate motifs, but here uh, some Artin motifs uh, actually appear almost always. And so the idea is to try to find the right mixture of upper and artin, upper motives and artin motives. And this is how we come to the definition of A upper. A upper motives, like in the title. Okay, so this is uh, next section. So, I mean, what sh sh should we look for? So if, if you go through the proof uh, of this theorem, which I didn't show you here, but well, if, if, you, if you do, then you see that um, what prevents uh, this proof uh, to work uh, in more general case is the following. So you start with a finite separable extension L over F and you consider a projective homogeneous variety over L. Okay. Then <coughs> you can view it as F variety uh, using just the composition. So you first go to spec L and then to spec F. So a very naive way to make an F variety of, out of an L variety, but this is the appropriate one here. And well, actually, this operation going from Y to YF uh, extends to motives. So if M is a motive over L, then you can get a similar way uh, an F motive which I denote MF. And so, uh, in particular, we can consider the upper motif of Y, which lives over L, and then uh, push it down to F. And the thing is, uh, like it was the case for the motif of the point, uh, this guy may decompose further, may be decomposable. And so, again, the question is, what are the summons? I mean, again, one summon is easy to get. You just consider the variety YF and its upper motive, which is indecomposable by definition. So this is a direct sum, summon here. But uh, it might be not the whole thing, so there might be some more. And those are not uh, upper motives anymore because of the same um, consideration <coughs> as before for art and motives. And so how can we control them? And here is the first proposition we got. It 
assume that L over F is Galo, which is of course not always the case in our settings, but nevertheless, it's a case to start with, right? <coughs> then uh, the summons, summons in <coughs> UYL are in one to one correspondence with the Artin motors which are summons in <coughs> ML. Well, sorry, this is UYF right? and MLF. <coughs> so There is a way to associ associate to every summon here an art and motive there. And it turns out that for a Gallo field extension, this association is one to one on the isomorphism classes. So in the composables correspond to in the composables. And so this uh, allows us to define UAY. So A upper motive. So now you see that A upper is just a mixture of Artin and upper. A upper motive of Y given by, well, since I like to have in the composable uh, motive, I take in the composable Artin motive A, which is a summoned in ML of F. Okay. Well, um, <coughs> M of F is not always. So if it, it is a direct sum, a direct sum in MF of L. M L F F, sorry, which is the case, for instance, uh, well, which is sometimes the case. I, I, I'm going to say it later about it if I have time. Then uh, U, this will be U of Y F, right? This is one in the composable thing which we sort of had before, and this is the same as U uh, M F of Y. Okay, so I hope the notations are fine, but we, we did our best um, developing them. And so uh, uh, this is uh, already quite a good description, well, good enough uh, in order to try to get the theorem we want to, we want to, to, to get. But the thing is uh, that we can only work with Galo extensions and so we need, need every uh, uh, L sitting inside of our Galo extension E over F to be also Galo over F, to be Galo. Which means that the Galo group of E over F should be a dedicate group. It's a group where each subgroup is normal. <coughs> and such groups uh, were classified uh, by the Dekind. Abelian groups are like that, but there are also non-abelian ones. But any such group, well, for instance, you can see it looking at the classification, is a product of P groups for various P. And uh, we have our particular P, so... Uh, <coughs> Let me call it gamma. Gamma will be decomposed as a P group. Oh, let me just try P group. Direct product with a group of uh, P cup co prime order. Let me put P prime group of order. 
prime to p. And so finally we realized that this is the only condition we need. So <coughs> now theorem, first theorem, which is sort of definition of uh, a, uh, a upper motive of motives in the highest generalities uh, we have is the following. So proposition, I will not repeat the statement, holds for <coughs> the case uh, where our gala field extension E over F is P separated. P separated. So this is again what we define. So this means that the gala group, oh, gamma, oh, gala group E over F uh, decomposes in a direct product of a P group <coughs> and a group of order prime to P. Okay, and so A upper motives are also defined in this more general setting. Okay, I have only like 15 minutes left. So let me formulate the main result. So I, it will be the analog of the old theorem I started with. So now we take our semi-simple group G and assume that it is P separately inner. Which means that it becomes, well, the, the field extension, minimal field extension E over F, we construct out of G is P separated. So for instance, uh, all absolutely simple groups, aside from D4, uh, D4, 6, right, are like that. But uh, well, of course, uh, this gives you much more groups uh, which are covered aside from absolutely simple ones. I just described. <coughs> so then summons of F, uh, summons of uh, in the complete decomposition of X, any G variety, are A upper motives. So Y, uh, sorry, U, A, Y, with some shift. Uh, so, well, I is clear some non-negative integer. Otherwise, uh, so you need uh, um, intermediate field L, so sitting between F and E, right? So next, you, this A should be in the composable summoned in MLF. And finally, Y should be G homogeneous variety over L. Homogeneous projective variety over L. Well, this is not uh, the end of the story yet because uh, having such result is only nice when you have a good criterion of isomorphisms for the summons which we describe, <coughs> which, which appear. And this is the second theorem. criterion of isomorphism. So here again, you are given two objects like that, not necessarily related to the same group, but both group have to be <coughs> P separately inner, right? So in order for this thing to be defined, so you have U, A, Y on one side, and on the other side, you have some A prime and some Y prime homogeneous under some G prime. <coughs> and so they are isomorphic if and only if the motive A and A prime are isomorphic, which of course not necessarily means that they come from the same field extension. <coughs> they can still be isomorphic. And 
uh, the weight transfer of y is equivalent, well, weight transfer to f. y is a variety over a separable field, ext uh, finite separable extension of f. And we take the weight transfer to f is equivalent to r of y prime. <coughs> Well, uh, this turns to be a very useful criterion, which uh, will make which may is makes it possible to to prove uh, what we want after that. But I, I just want to mm, uh, get your attention to the fact that it's it's quite un, uh, unexpected that weight transfer appears here. There there, there was no weight transfer before, right? So we we used uh, other simpler way to make L varieties to F varieties. <coughs> Here it appears, but actually it can be it can be replaced by the equivalence of variety Y F and Y prime F. So you can exchange those two, but the one with weight transfer is more useful because the varieties you get here are geometrically integral and well, well, how, how you play with them, you usually do things by induction going over the function field of the variety. Well, if you do this with varieties which are ge geometrically integral, this is fine. This will not affect uh, Artin motifs at all. Uh, but uh, when you play with function fields of those varieties, which have a big constant, a big field of constants, uh, this will destroy, this make uh, in decomposable art and motives decomposable and so on. And so everything got uh, completely messy. On the other hand, those two conditions are not equivalent. So they are only equivalent unto this additional <laughs> assumption. So uh, motives here are non-zero because they are decomposable. Actually, it's enough to have, well, the information you need for equivalence of those two is just isomorphism like that for, for Non-zero motives. <coughs> uh, I mean, if you if your varieties y and y prime are just points over extensions, then take weight transfer just makes them to uh, the base point over f, right? And then you will always have the left condition. But the right condition is equivalence uh, of uh, Artin motives given by two different extensions, l over f and l prime over f. So this is really some some important information, and this is hidden in the isomorphism of the uh, Artin motives, yes. Well, I mean, I have the standard setting here, y lives over L, right? And so the weight transfer I have here is RLF, because I want to get F variety in the end, so I want criteria in terms of F varieties. And the other transfer, I can put prime here, is from L prime to F. Okay. So, okay, so we are almost there. So here is uh, the corollary of those two theorems. In the spirit of uh, DQ re uh, result for uh, the groups of inner type I cited before. So M of X is isomorphic to M of X prime. It's clear that I'm working uh, under the assumptions I need uh, for those theorems to, uh, to work. <coughs> if and only if X and X prime have the same Artentate traces. Right? And I think you may guess what these Artentate traces are. You just take the part of the, well, same art and date traces over all extensions, over all base field extensions, like before. So the only difference with the result we had before is that uh, instead of looking at date traces, which are the, the date parts of the complete uh, motivic decompositions, we look at the art and date traces which is the Argentate part of the complete uh, motivic decomposition. And again, uh, this can be generalized to arbitrary sum of A upper motives on the left and on the right. And in this situation, 
uh, we have example showing that uh, just looking at tail traces is not enough uh, to be sure that the motifs are isomorphic. <laughs> On the other hand, when uh, only talking about motifs of varieties, like here, it is still possible that tail traces are enough, but we can't prove it yet. <coughs> and so in the remaining five minutes, uh, let me explain something about the structure of these A upper motifs, which will make uh, the statement of the isomorphism criterion more apparent, I think. <coughs> oh, uh, well, so we, we work with this uh, P separated case. Uh, which is sort of easy combination of two opposite cases. One case is where L over F is a P power. And other case is when L over F is uh, not divisible by P. So case one, case two. So in both cases, L over F sits inside of E over F which is our Galois extension, which we assume to be P separated. Okay. Then the situation is simpler. In the first case, it turns out that the motif MLF isn't decomposable. I think it's a well-known fact about Artin motifs. And since uh, summons here control our A upper motives, we don't have many. So only have, well, uh, what happens is that the upper motive of Y viewed over F doesn't decompose. And so you can also write it as U of YF if you prefer. But anyway, there is almost nothing new here, right? And so it looks like clear that uh, this criterion should hold in this situation. Well, a little bit more uh, interesting in the case two, where the degree of uh, the field extensions is co-prime with P. Uh, well, here you may have, uh, so here uh, the, this motive decomposes. But what happens is that there is sort of basic one, which is U of YF. So with F inside, okay, tensor by A. And so again, for instance, if you know that uh, A and A prime are isomorphic, uh, so you have isomorphism for the second factors, and uh, at least the condition like that tells you that um, first factors for your two varieties are isomorphic as well. And so there is no wonder that you have this criterion. So it is still some work to get to the arbitrary case. But as I said, it's a combination of those two. So at least uh, everything becomes uh, believable, I guess. And so this is a good point uh, to stop. Thank you very much for your attention.